Rifles. Perhaps the most popular weapon category in all of Ready or Not. There are 12 in total, and today I'll be ranking them all from F tier to S tier. But before that, one note. I've said in previous videos that these tier lists are just my opinion, but some of you have still found a way to argue about it, and I don't want to miss out on the fun. Everything in this video is objective fact, and if you disagree, you're wrong. Anyways, firearms in law enforcement are often adopted after a significant shootout occurs. That's certainly been the case with rifles. Historically, police officers usually had a handgun on their belt and a shotgun in their patrol vehicle. However, several police shootings convinced law enforcement agencies that rifles were a key component of police officer equipment. For the LAPD, the most infamous shooting in this regard was the 1997 North Hollywood shootout. On February 28th, 1997, two bank robbers decided they would rob a Bank of America in North Hollywood. They had come ready to fight. Both were equipped with body armor and had six different rifles between the two of them. What ensued was one of the largest law enforcement involved shootouts in history. The two robbers were killed by police officers, but not before injuring 20 people and firing nearly 2,000 rounds. Most of these police officers were armed with 38 special revolvers and shotguns. Unfortunately for them, their effectiveness was mixed. There were multiple reports of these firearms failing to penetrate the robber's body armor. In response to this event, there was a nationwide push to arm law enforcement officers with rifles. And these days, Rifles are an invaluable part of any police officer's tools. So with that said, let's get started. Our first rifle is the Mark 18 Mod Zero. Everyone knows what the AR-15 is, and these days, you can build one to be any length or size you want. However, this wasn't always the case. Toward the late 20th century, the American military had generally been issuing the M4 and M16 rifles. While these are great rifles, they're both somewhat long, and a little more difficult to maneuver in close quarters. The Navy SEALs in particular had a need for a submachine gun sized weapon that could still fire intermediate rifle cartridges. So, NSWC Crane developed what was known as the Close Quarter Battle Receiver, or CQBR. An interesting trait of the AR-15 is that it splits into an upper and lower receiver. This means that you can mix and match uppers and lowers. The CQBR was essentially an AR-15 upper with a 10.3-inch barrel, significantly shorter than the M4A1's 14.5-inch barrel. If operators already had an M4, all they needed to do was swap the M4 upper for the CQBR one. This rifle combination instantly proved popular. As the popularity of the CQBR expanded across the military, production also began on a complete rifle package that included among other items, both the CQBR upper and a lower. This combination became known as the Mark 18 Mod Zero. Its adoption quickly spread beyond US special operations, and of course, the rifle eventually found its way into the hands of law enforcement. For that purpose, the Mark 18 Mod Zero is a phenomenal weapon. Police officers who have to use a firearm usually do so in relatively close range. So having a small weapon that fires rifle rounds is a great solution. These days, AR-15s have seen even more advancement. Hundreds of companies make an AR-15 with a shorter barrel, but the Mark 18 Mod Zero was the first, and is still used to this day. In Ready or Not, the Mark 18 Mod Zero is just as effective as its real counterpart. It has a host of accessory options for you to use, and a similar variety of optics to choose from. Its length also makes it easier to maneuver in tight spaces, which becomes useful when you need to respond quickly to a threat that's in your face. Something that could be considered a downside is that the Mark 18 has a non-removable front sight post. When you mount an optic, the front sight will block a portion of the optic window. Personally, it doesn't matter to me, and some people actually find this useful. If you've ever tried shooting a target up close and ready or not, you may have noticed that the bullet impact isn't where your red dot is. This is not a glitch, 
It's an in-game replication of a real phenomenon called Hide Over Bore. Optics are never mounted in line with a gun barrel. It's physically impossible. There will always be a height difference between the gun barrel and the optic. Additionally, bullets don't travel in a straight line. Without going into a crazy amount of detail, bullets typically travel in an arc. The proper way to set up an optic is to line up the reticle with a set distance during the bullet trajectory. For example, if I lined up my red dot with bullet impacts at 50 meters, I know that at 50 meters, the bullets will go exactly where the red dot is. This means that at distances closer than 50 meters, the bullets will hit below the red dot, as shown in game. If you want to shoot targets at close distance, you'll need to memorize where the bullet impacts in relation to your reticle. This is where the front sight comes in. The front sight sits lower than the red dot, and is closer to the gun barrel. If you aim with the front sight, its point of impact will be at a closer distance than with the red dot, meaning you can use it to aim at closer targets. An effective weapon with an iconic look. The Mark 18 is easily a S-tier weapon. The AR-15 is a great weapon, but just like any widely adopted weapon, it's seen its fair share of issues, and as a result, there have been a number of attempts to replace it. This desire for a new weapon spawned several interesting variants of 5.56 rifles. One of these rifles is the FN SCAR. In the early 2000s, there were reports of M4s and M16s struggling in the desert conditions of the Middle East. So in 2004, the United States Special Operations Command issued a solicitation for a new rifle. It was to be a reliable weapon platform that would have both a 5.56 and a 7.62x51 version. The FN SCAR was the rifle that won the competition. And in 2009, the rifle was issued to a number of units, most notably the 75th Ranger Regiment. Though somewhat limited, it's seen use in over 20 different countries. One of the reasons the FN SCAR was adopted was its reliability. The AR-15 uses what's called a direct impingement gas system. When a round is fired, some gas going down the barrel will bleed off and enter the gas tube. This gas will travel through and push on the gas key, cycling the bolt and chambering the next round. It's an efficient and low recoiling system. But since the gas travels all the way into the action, this means that the action of the rifle will get dirtier faster than other semi-auto systems. In contrast, the SCAR uses what's called a short stroke gas piston system. In this system, gas is also bled off from the fired round. However, rather than just having a gas tube, the gas pushes on a piston located inside the gas tube. This piston in turn pushes back on the bolt carrier, cycling the gun and chambering the next round. Compared to direct impingement, very little gas reaches the action meaning that it stays cleaner for longer and makes the weapon more reliable. In Ready or Not, the SCAR is a 5.56 version. If you look at it though, you might notice something off. The SCAR in game comes with an AR buffer tube. What the fuck is that? I don't understand why. One requirement of the direct impingement gas system is that you need a buffer tube to house the buffer and buffer spring. With a short stroke gas piston system, it doesn't require the buffer tube, meaning you're free to use whatever stock you want. Replacing the SCAR's folding stock with a buffer tube makes no sense and looks extremely ugly. The weapon works well and has every attachment you need. The empty reload is also pretty cool. I take a tenth of a second, it's, it's just a tenth of a second to look at that and realize I have a double feed and treat it differently. But it looks so ugly. And what's worse, is that the normal version is right there, on the wall. For these reasons, the SCAR goes into B tier. The next weapon is not one that was designed to replace the AR-15. However, it shares many traits with rifles that were meant to be AR-15 replacements. The G36 is a 5.56 rifle designed by the company h &K. It replaced the G3 battle rifle that was previously in service with the German military. In many ways, the G36 is the direct inverse of the G3. It fires a smaller round and is primarily made out of polymer. This makes the rifle lightweight 
and enables a soldier to carry more ammunition than they would be able to with a G3. There are many different G36 variants that come in all different sizes. The most compact of these is the G36C. This version comes with a short folding stock and 9 inch barrel, making it very easy to maneuver in close quarters. The G36C is the version in Ready or Not. However, there's one key difference between a conventional G36C and the one in-game. The carry handle is gone. What the G36 in-game has is the Knight's Armament front and rear sights. These are a set of sights that replace the G36 carry handle. This allows an operator to manipulate the charging handle easier and also makes the weapon less bulky. The look of this G36 is incredibly polarizing. People either love it or hate it. I happen to love the look without a carry handle, so of course, I like the look of the one in-game. There's one more quirk of the G36 in Ready or Not. Like the scar before it, the G36C also uses the short stroke gas piston system. It's a reliable system, but one of its downsides is that it has more recoil compared to an AR-15. In-game however, this is not the case. In fact, the G36 in Ready or Not is one of the lowest recoiling rifles in-game. Why this is doesn't make sense, but it makes the gun that much easier to use. The only complaints I have with the G36 in Ready or Not is the optic selection. Compared to the other rifles in-game, the G36 only has a few to choose from. Luckily, one of the options is the Trijicon SRO, which is one of my favorites. But a lot of the other optics just aren't available. This is odd, because the rail could definitely fit some of the other optics. In fact, the real sight rail is long enough to fit a LPVO, so I'm not sure why there's so few options in-game. The G36 in Ready or Not is very effective, and is among the lowest recoiling 5.56 guns in-game. And most importantly, the gun just looks cool. Without any doubt, the G36 goes into S tier. H&K as a company primarily focuses on providing weapons to militaries around the world. This, of course, includes the United States. In the 1990s, Delta Force Research and Development NCO Larry Vickers requested a carbine for use in CQB. H&K was quick to oblige. This new carbine was intended to replace H&K's own MP5. While the MP5 is a very reliable weapon, the 9mm cartridge it fires was considered too weak for the missions Delta Force was going on. This new weapon needed to fire a rifle round, be as compact as possible, and be reliable enough to withstand the abuse and round counts that come with being an issued rifle for Delta Force. H&K as a company is known for creating innovative and complex designs, but their initial idea for this rifle was quite simple. Take the short stroke piston system of the G36 and put it into an AR-15 platform. Of course, there was more to it than that, but the resulting rifle was the HK416. The HK416 is a very reliable rifle. It uses an updated version of the short stroke gas piston system seen in the G36. The rifle also has AR-15 controls and ergonomics. Operators who are trained on the AR-15 will be able to use the HK416 without any issue. In many ways, it seemed like it was simply a more reliable version of the AR-15, while retaining all the benefits of the latter. Since its production, the rifle has been adopted by a number of units, including LAPD's SWAT team. Perhaps most famously, on May 2nd, 2011, dev crew operators stormed a compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, and killed Osama bin Laden. The rifle they used was, of course, the HK-416. In Ready or Not, the version of the HK416 we see is the HK416A5, a newer, lighter variant with ambidextrous controls and an adjustable gas block. It also features an aftermarket Geisley handguard, which makes the rifle more comfortable to hold. Being the latest and greatest version of the gun, the HK416 in Ready or Not can accommodate any attachment you want, as well as any optic. I'll be honest, I love the HK416. Even if the gun was complete trash in game, I would still use it. But thankfully, it isn't. The HK416 in Ready or Not is quite an effective weapon and looks the part as well. So it goes into S tier. One solution to issues the AR-15 was facing was to replace its direct impingement system. 
However, there was an alternative approach. Improve on the AR-15's gas system. This was the option the company Knight's Armament took. The company's SR-16 rifle is meant to be an improvement of the AR-15. It features a proprietary bolt and gas system that runs cleaner, reduces gas blowback in the face, and improves felt recoil. And it works. In the real world, a Knight's Armament rifle is one of the nicest you can own. It's also had some pretty interesting users, most notably the US Secret Service. In-game, the weapon is effective and can mount all the attachments you need, including an LPVO that can't adjust magnification. There's one thing to note about the SR-16 in Ready or Not. It's the longest rifle in the game. While it's still a relatively short gun, with a barrel length of 11.5 inches, it's longer than every other primary weapon. You'll need to make sure you stay an adequate amount of distance away from walls, so you're still able to use the weapon. The SR-16 is a great rifle to use in Ready or Not, and is very nice to look at. Therefore, it goes into A tier. Our next weapon is the ARWC. I have no idea what this is supposed to stand for, but it seems to be a stand-in for the Wilson Combat SBR Tactical. This is essentially another short-barreled AR-15. In-game, it's gone through a few changes. When it was first released in Early Access, it was chambered in 5.56, then changed to 300 Blackout. In the 1.0 release, it's seemingly gone back to being a 5.56 gun, but there's no actual confirmation other than the engraving on the rifle. The gun also features an M-Lock handguard. All the rifles we've talked about so far feature either a standard railed handguard or a proprietary mounting system. Railed handguns are very robust, but have one main disadvantage. They're heavy. M-Lock is a different type of mounting system. Rather than having all rails built into the handguard, it instead has rectangular slots cut out. In these slots, you can either attach rail segments or directly mount attachments designed to fit into the slots. This helps cut down weight on the weapon, but still allows attachments to remain secure on the gun. Though the majority of rifles in professional use still use rails, there has been a shift towards M-Lock in more well-funded organizations. The Wilson Combat Rifle works well in Ready or Not. But while it's effective, I'm not as sold on its looks. The stock has too many odd shapes going on, and the magwell looks odd. For these reasons, the ARWC goes into B tier. Our next rifle is the SIG MCX. This is another short stroke gas piston rifle that retains most of the AR-15 controls. This rifle has become more of a family of firearms, with numerous variants in different calibers. Since its inception, it's been adopted by many different militaries and law enforcement agencies. The one in Ready or Not is a first generation rifle, identifiable by the key mod handguard. It's easy to shoot and has all the attachments you need. The MCX has become a reliable rifle platform that has gained favor across the globe. However, I'm not a fan of the first generation MCXs because of the key mod handguard. Key mod is a mounting system that functions similarly to MLOC. However, it's extremely ugly and has been shown to not be as robust as MLOC in extreme testing. So, the MCX goes into B tier. 556x45 is an interesting caliber. It's a relatively small round but the damage it does is quite substantial compared to its size. When the bullet impacts, it will tumble and yaw, causing severe damage to organic tissue. However, this effect only happens when the bullet is traveling at or above 2900 feet per second. One way to achieve this velocity is to have a longer barrel. But of course, a longer barrel means a longer gun. For CQB, a longer barrel isn't ideal. The bullpup rifle is one solution. It places the action of the rifle at the back of the gun, allowing the barrel to extend throughout the rifle. This makes for an overall compact weapon while keeping a longer barrel length. As an example, the rifle on the left has a 10.3 inch barrel, while the bullpup rifle on the right has a 16 inch barrel. However, their overall lengths are about the same. The F90 modular bullpup rifle is the only bullpup rifle in Ready or Not. If you know your ballpups, you'll realize this rifle looks somewhat similar to the Steyr AUG. This is no accident, as the F90 was designed to replace the AUG. 
Bullpups may seem like a perfect solution, but in practice, they have several key disadvantages. Their triggers are usually heavy and mushy, the controls of the weapons can be in odd places, and some use proprietary magazines that are hard to find outside of their country of production. The F90 aims to solve some of these problems. The rifle is compatible with common AR-15 mags. The magazine release is forward of the trigger guard, and the bolt release is by the magwell, making them both easier to use. In-game, the F90 is a great weapon. Its overall short length makes the weapon easy to maneuver in close quarters, but the longer barrel ensures it's still capable of making longer shots. For some reason, the gun also has very little recoil. Among the 556 guns in game, it's one of the easiest and most satisfying to use. If I was judging these guns purely by form and function, the F90 would easily go into S tier. I enjoy using the rifle in game quite a bit, and I think it looks cool as well. However, as we've established, these weapon tier lists are based on whatever I arbitrarily decide matters. The F90 is made by an Australian company called Lithgow Arms. They make a few different firearms, mostly for military use. Since around 2016, the company had been developing a semi-automatic version of the F90 called the Atrax and had planned to bring it to the civilian market. However, in 2019, the company announced that they were cancelling plans for a civilian version based on ethical grounds. They haven't expanded on what this actually meant, but they're an Australian company catering to the military and law enforcement, so take your best guess. While it's unclear whether this decision was truly based on so-called ethical grounds, or simply a way to back out of a bad business decision without admitting to it, I think it's incredibly stupid either way, and not something I can condone, even when discussing a video game. For this reason alone, the F90 goes into F tier. 556x45 is a good round, but it has its limitations. As stated, it requires a longer barrel for its full effect. It's also quite loud for its size, even when suppressed. There were some groups that needed a quiet rifle round that could perform well out of a smaller weapon. Thus, the 300 Blackout round was born. 300 Blackout is a larger round than 556, and also has a relatively low terminal velocity. This means two things. 1. 300 Blackout does not need as long of a barrel, since its terminal velocity is already so low. 2. The round is very quiet, especially when suppressed. For operators that need a small and quiet weapon, but the lethality of a rifle round, 300 Blackout is a no-brainer. Our first 300 Blackout weapon in Ready or Not is once again the MCX. However, this one is a little different from the one we already talked about. Named the Low Visibility Assault Weapon, it's chambered in 300 Blackout and features an integral suppressor. The handguard on this MCX is extremely thick, to accommodate a suppressor under the handguard. You might be wondering, what's the point of all these unique features when you can just thread a suppressor on a standard MCX? Well, when you put a suppressor on a conventional rifle, it becomes long. If you put a suppressor on a shorter weapon, you'll still have an overall small weapon, but it won't be very comfortable to handle. Shorter weapons are generally more difficult to hold up with your support hand. Rifles are easier to hold up when you can extend your support arm further on the gun. Having a handguard cover the suppressor means you can have a small suppressed weapon that's still comfortable to hold. In-game, the MCX LVAW is an excellent weapon. The integral suppressor makes the weapon very short and easy to maneuver. 300 Blackout is also noticeably quieter than 556 suppressed, though it won't stop suspects from being alerted to your presence. In real life, 300 Blackout isn't a great round for armor penetration. To pierce armor, a bullet needs to be traveling fast. 300 Blackout does not travel fast. But for some reason, and ready or not, 300 Blackout is one of the best rounds for defeating body armor. Usually, it only takes two or three rounds to put an armored suspect down. It's a great gun for completing the harder missions in the game. And finally, any integral suppressed weapon looks cool. And the LVAW is no exception. Because it's very effective and looks incredibly good, the LVAW goes into S tier. The other weapon in 300 Blackout is the BRN-180. It has an interesting history. Created by the American company Brownells in conjunction with PWS and FM products, the gun is essentially a modern take on the older ARN-180. 
while incorporating as many features of the AR-15 as possible. In fact, the only proprietary part of the gun is its upper. It'll fit on any standard AR-15 lower receiver. As such, the gun shoots well, and is easy to use, thanks to its AR-15 controls. It's also quite compact, making it well suited for close quarters. One thing I personally like is the side charging handle. I find these easier to use than the AR-15 charging handles. In-game, the gun performs very well. 300 Blackout lets it defeat most armor, and it has any attachment you would want. What sets this gun apart from almost every other weapon in Ready or Not is that it was designed first and foremost for the civilian market. That's unfortunately relatively unique, and absolutely something I need to commend. The only drawback to the BRN-180 in Ready or Not is that the LVAW is a better choice for 300 Blackout rifle. The BRN-180 suppressed is longer than the LVAW, and both have very similar ballistic capability. It's not a huge difference, but the LVAW is shorter. So for these reasons, the BRN-180 goes into A tier. Next, we have the only usable AK platform in Ready or Not, the SLR-47. I've previously made a video on this gun, and some people have gotten pretty upset about something I said. So let me clarify one thing. If quality is equal, a 7.62x39 AK is not as accurate as a 5.56 AR-15. Period. That's not to say AKs aren't accurate weapons. Generally speaking, their accuracy is on par, if not better, than most other military rifles. But AR-15s are somewhat of an exception, and are generally more accurate than most other rifles. And there you have it. Even when I try to use what I would consider to be a more accurate version of an AK with what I would consider to be better ammo than you typically shoot out of an AK, it still comes up short in terms of accuracy when compared to an AR-15 M16 platform. Now, there are tons of anecdotal stories about how one person's AK was more accurate than another person's AR-15. I don't doubt these stories, but there are so many factors that can contribute to a rifle's accuracy. Ammunition, aftermarket parts, and most importantly, the shooter themselves, will have a significant impact on weapon accuracy. It's absolutely true that there are many AKs that are more accurate than AR-15s. But again, if both rifles are from quality manufacturers and are using good ammunition, a 7.62x39 AK is not as accurate as a 5.56 AR-15. With that said, let's talk about the actual gun. The AK in Ready or Not isn't an AKS-74U. Rather, it's an Arsenal SLR-107UR. This is a 7.62x39 AK that's built on a Bulgarian stamped receiver and sold on the American market. The AK uses its own type of gas system, called the Long Stroke Gas Piston System. It's very similar to our Short Stroke Gas Piston System, the main difference being that the piston is physically attached to the bolt carrier. This is a very reliable system but has more recoil than both a direct impingement and short stroke gas piston system. The AK platform isn't a weapon typically seen in the hands of Western law enforcement. However, there are a few who prefer it. According to a 2016 article, certain police officers stationed in extremely northern areas of Alaska chose to use 7.62x39 AKs as their patrol rifles. They were chosen due to their ability to function in cold weather climates, especially when compared to AR-15s. Similar to 300 Blackout, 7.62x39 also has a relatively low terminal velocity. This means that shorter barrels won't significantly affect the velocity of the round. This means you can have a short-barreled AK like the SLR-47 without losing much ballistic capability. In-game, the SLR-47 is quite a good weapon. It fires a heavy round and has a good assortment of attachments and optics, though not as many as other rifles. 7.62x39 performance against armor in real life is mixed, but in-game, it's phenomenal. Similar to 300 Blackout in-game, it requires very few rounds to drop an armored suspect. Also, the reloads for this gun are some of the best AK reloads I've seen in any game. No funky Iraqi reload or over-exaggerated mag knockout here, just pure Travis Haley goodness. So, the SLR-47 goes into A tier.
Last, but certainly not least, is the SA-58 OSW. This gun is awesome. Based on the iconic FNFAL, the SA-58 OSW is essentially an 11-inch barrel version of the FAL. The SA-58 OSW fires the 7.62x51 round, which is the largest round in game. 7.62x51 is typically meant to be fired at longer ranges from larger rifles. Fired from a shorter barrel, it's immediately apparent that 7.62x51 is not meant to be used in CQB. The gun's recoil is significant, is very loud, and has a ton of flash and smoke when fired, especially with the muzzle brake. As far as I've looked, no Western police force currently uses the SA-58 OSW as their patrol rifle. So the question is, what's the point of this gun? This weapon is a menace. No matter what kind of armor suspects are wearing, it'll take a maximum of two rounds to put them down. Of course, the power of this round means you'll need to aim your shots carefully, as a missed round can overpenetrate and hit something you didn't intend to shoot. But really, you should be doing that with any firearm. The SA-58 OSW is one of the best weapons in Ready or Not. When you're tired of doing non-lethal runs and want to kill everything on a map, this is your gun. Other than the shotguns, there is no gun more violent than this rifle. When you use this gun, every armed suspect will be alerted to your presence. Normally, this wouldn't be a good thing. But when you use the SA-58 OSW, it demands blood. So, that's all the rifles in Ready or Not. Honestly, you can't go wrong with any of them, so choose your favorite and start putting down suspects. Since I've done a tier list on all weapon categories in Ready or Not, you might be wondering, what's next? Well, I'm happy to announce that I will start streaming on Twitch. Give a follow if you like. You may get a peek at what I'm working on next. I'll be announcing when I stream through community posts, so stay subscribed if you want to see those. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.